You know, I first came to Durham in 1946 as a freshman at Duke University. And the war was just over, World War II. I grew up in Greensboro. And the year just before I graduated from high school, uh, the war ended with two atomic bombs being dropped on Japan. This was one of the most traumatic experiences for my own generation. Because it seemed to us that if we didn't bring this situation under control, that is, the control of these nuclear weapons, that humanity couldn't survive. Humanity probably couldn't survive a nuclear war. Now, at first, the United States was the only country with nuclear weapons, but we understood very well that sooner or later, other countries are going to get them. And the destructive power is such that if they keep making them, mankind, for the first time in its history, is going to have the ability to destroy itself. And we developed that ability over those next few years. At the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union each had nearly 60,000 nuclear warheads. And most of them were many times more powerful than those bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What are we going to do about it? How can we live with that? Well, my wife, who came to Duke from Tennessee the same year I did, and I were charter members of an organization called United World Federalists. We thought if we didn't create a world government to control these things, well, we weren't going to survive. As we learned more about the world, and increasingly, I became interested particularly not only in foreign languages, but particularly in Russian. It was the other great superpower developing. It was the country that had probably been done more than any other to defeat Hitler uh, in World War II, had taken tremendous losses. Yes, they were communists, which was a terrible system. That's something else I understood. But it did seem to me that Look, if we're going to survive, we're going to have to deal with other countries in a way that prevents the future use of these nuclear weapons. And it's not going to be a world government. Probably, given how different cultures are in the world, that's not a good idea. Because governments, almost in any culture, can, if certain steps are made, get too much powerful going to have to be done through diplomacy. Now, when my wife and I were students, we we're both Duke class of 1950. Now, before, well before most of you were born, uh, there was another big problem facing us here at home, and that was racial segregation. Every school we went to had only white, and maybe a few Asian students. And the same is true of the colleges. One of the first student legislatures we went to was all white. First thing we did was vote, have all of the students come in, those from what we then call the colored colleges. And the next year when they came, we desegregated education in North Carolina. So our generation as students did that well before the Supreme Court decision, which eventually did. Well, my own career, moving ahead, was one that took me out of the country. I went into the Foreign Service because I was convinced that if we had to control these nuclear weapons, we had to make sure 
that humanity didn't stumble into a situation where it would destroy itself. As a foreign service officer, I began to serve time and time again in the Soviet Union. Also, I had several very interesting tours in Africa, West Africa, East Africa, some in Europe. But by the time of the Reagan administration, I was probably the most experienced, uh, what we would call Russian specialist in the Foreign Service. And in 1983, during sort of the second year of Reagan's first term, when he decided it was time to negotiate with the Soviet Union, I was called on to come to the White House and to work out a negotiating plan. Now, what was clear to me at that time was that the Soviet system was not working well. They were overcommitted, and also it was a system which it was a, a totalitarian system that deprived people, and, and a very talented people, of their basic human rights. But they had enough nuclear weapons, not only to destroy us, but the whole world. We had enough nuclear weapons, not only to destroy them, but the whole world. In fact, some people said, you know, if all these weapons are used, you won't destroy civilization or humanity just once. You'll do it seven times. And somebody else calculated, no, 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 20 times. I said, look, after you've destroyed everything once, why do you want to do it again? <laughs> I mean, this, it was almost the ultimate idiocy. And you could say, how could anybody think that way? Well, we weren't building these weapons to use them. We were building them we, because we thought, if we don't have at least as many as the other side, they may use them on us. So, and then they would see us building more. If we don't build enough to keep them from using it on us, we will lose. Now, one of the first things when Mikhail Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union. And we decided that he and Reagan would meet. One of the first things we proposed to Gorbachev was a statement. A nuclear war cannot be won, must never be fought, and therefore there can be no war between us. They signed up to that, and we took it seriously. Our Secretary of State then went to them with charts saying, look at all this we're putting into arms. We're robbing our people. Actually, it was hurting them more than us. We had a bigger economy. We had a more productive economy. And you know, in their memoirs, they say this was the most powerful argument that allowed us, actually, to end the Cold War and to end it by negotiation, by beginning radical reduction of these nuclear weapons. Actually, both Reagan and Gorbachev wanted to eliminate them altogether. And they came very close to agreeing to that. But it was a story I would take much too long here. It's in my books as to how they came near to agreeing, but then didn't quite. Nevertheless, we started on a course that, in effect, ended the Cold War and ended that race, but it didn't eliminate these weapons. Now, how did we do that? We did it by negotiation, not by threatening them. Yes, we wanted them to improve human rights, but we had talked to them privately about that. Again. President Reagan understood you can't put another leader under public pressure and expect that leader simply to back down. It makes him look weak. You need to convince them that what you want them to do is actually in their interest, and it was. 
because they were hurting even more than we were from this arms race. So through quiet diplomacy, through appealing actually to what was their own real interests, within just a few years, we ended the confrontation. The Cold War ended. We thought this whole nuclear genie had been under control. Well, what happened? We came in a new administration, and suddenly we start talking about we won the Cold War, as if Russia was defeated. Russia wasn't defeated in the Cold War. The Soviet Union broke up because of internal pressures. After the pressures of the Cold War were released, everything Gorbachev did to end the Cold War was in their interest. And then we began to act as if our power also made us better than anybody else. That our system was one that, well, everybody should have, and if they don't want it, we should impose it upon them. And so what do we have today? Enough nuclear weapons in both Russia and the United States that, again, will destroy humanity if they're ever used. And we had an agreement, goes way back into the 1970s, about nonproliferation. The countries with nuclear weapons said, OK, we will gradually reduce ours. And if other countries agree not to have them, then we will eventually eliminate ours. Well, we did reduce. But you know, after the end of the Cold War, we stopped reducing both Russia and the United States. Russia and the United States still have over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. And instead of negotiating, instead of trying to find a common interest, we today are talking as if we and Russia are enemies again. That's a dangerous situation. And it makes those of us who tried to deal with this issue and the other thing wonder, have we learned anything? Are we capable, really, of learning from our experience? Or do we look at our power as somehow the result of our virtue, rather than a number of accidents of history? And one which also, if we are going to continue to deal with our problems, uh, that we need to concentrate, first of all, at home. The other issue I mentioned that we had as the students, we've made great progress. We have a society far fairer than it was as I grew up. But we got a ways to go. And you know, when we were talking to the Soviet Union about human rights, they had real problems. Secretary of State, George Schultz presented a list of cases that we thought human rights violation to Edward Shevardnadze, the, the new foreign minister of the Soviet Union at that time. He took that list and he said, all right, I'll take this list back. But tell me, I, I think you need some advice about your, the status of women and blacks in the United States. Can we talk about that? Schultz said, of course. I think we're making progress. We've got a ways to go. We can use all the help we can get. That was our spirit in our negotiations then. And within 18 months in another private meeting, when we brought up these human rights issues, Shevardnadze took the list. By that time, he and Schultz were on a first name basis. And they were sitting at a meeting in New York. There were just a few of us in the room. And Shevardnadze took that list. And he said, OK, George, I'll take this back to Moscow. And if what you say is true, I'm going to do my best to do it, to take care of it. And then he paused and he said, but I want you to know one thing. I'm not doing this because you asked me to. I'm doing it because it's what my country needs to do. 
Schultz stood up. Shevardnadze stood up. They shook hands across the table. And the American Secretary of State said, Edward, I will never ask you to do something that I do not think is in your country's interest. The Cold War was over. Well, compare that today as to how we react publicly with the Russian president. I'm not defending him, putting him on, <laughs> constantly criticizing, constantly, uh, constantly demanding things for them to do, while at home, don't we have enough power problems to take care of ourselves? That's where our concentration needs to be. And we must not forget that we have not yet solved this problem of nuclear weapons. That's one for your generation. And I hope you'll be able to deal with it at least as well as my generation did. Thank you very much.